Okay, so um, I wanted to start um, by uh, just asking each of our panelists to, um, to briefly um, address the question in the title of, uh, of, this, um, of this session. Um, why is there no Silicon Valley in Europe? Um, and I guess the obvious follow-up to that is, should there be? So, um, Marvin, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, my perspective is Silicon Valley is, is global. So you think about Silicon Valley as basically sort of the hub, and you have these spokes of whether it's Budapest or Berlin or London. I actually think it's, it's a mindset. I actually don't think there should be a Silicon Valley in Europe, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm from Boston, and I agree. There shouldn't be a Silicon Valley in, in Budapest. There should be a Boston in uh, Europe. And uh, uh, I think that Boston is a better model. It's closer uh, in distance. It's closer in culture to Europe. And uh, in many ways, uh, it is uh, smaller and more achievable, not to say that we shouldn't shoot for the stars, but let's first conquer the moon. Okay. Martin. Um, well, I would give two pointers to that, and they've actually been given already previously by Adam in, in the previous speech. I mean, one of them is clearly the fragmentation that in Europe we are much more fragmented and in Silicon Valley you have an enormous concentration of brains, of capital, of uh, entrepreneurial universities bringing out new capital and also attracting them. And that's the second part is migration. He said that very clearly that Silicon Valley attracts the brightest minds and in Europe we are giving some of them away. So, so that's part of the secret to keep the people here but also to attract them. Okay. And what it cost us? I guess uh, the short answer is there is no Silicon Valley in Europe because Europe is not trying to have one. And uh, I think the main reason for that is a question of mentality. Europeans are not uh, born to be risk takers or not raised to be risk takers, um, same as the community uh, in Silicon Valley is. And I think uh, the European Union has to work a lot to change that. Uh, but I guess we'll have a chance to talk about this. Okay. Um, so, um, just to run through that, so Marvin, you don't think there should be a Silicon Valley in Europe because it's a mindset. Gabor, you think there should be a Boston in Europe um, rather than a um, Silicon Valley in Europe. Martin, I'm not sure, so do you think there should be or there shouldn't be a Silicon Valley? So you've talked about why there isn't, should there be one? I don't think there should be an identical Silicon Valley, you know, that we should uh, adopt some of that mindset and we should adopt some of the access of it, but we shouldn't certainly try to copy what there is. Also, it would take quite long. I mean, Stanford University was established in 1891, so I think to, to go build that up is also a history behind it, so it's nothing you can do overnight, and I think we need to work on things more quickly than that. Okay. Um, Costa, so from your tone, I, I presume you think there should be? Or I definitely think there should be a hub that champions talent the same way Silicon Valley does in America. Uh, I definitely do not think that we should copy everything that happens across the Atlantic and we should build up on uh, the strengths um, of, of Europe and the Europeans. Uh, but definitely there should be a hub where startups can find their home and succeed. A hub, not, uh, a, not a hub in each country, a European hub, a pan-European hub? Perhaps. Uh, I, think, I think there should be a European hub. The distances geographically are not so big uh, mm -hmm. in, in the territory of the European Union. And the prices are going down in terms of transport and uh, communication. So uh, I think there should be one hub um, on European soil uh, to do the same uh, where startups can find their, their home. I, I don't know if I completely agree with that because I actually think that there's going to be in my opinion, there's going to be sort of multiple hubs. So, for example, London is slowly becoming the fintech capital. There's a lot of interesting companies focusing on fintech. Um, in Germany, it's e-commerce, right? You know, whether you like or hate the, the Sammer brothers, they've actually done a, a great service, in my opinion, to the entrepreneurial community and trained a lot of people, even though they're probably horrible human beings, right? Um, and I also think, like, if you take a look at um, in Spain, you know, it could be fashion tech hub. They're seeing a lot of interesting companies, or, or France as well, too. I, I think you're starting to see some expertise sort of develop in all these different areas. Um, and I think that's actually ultimately a good thing. But would, not, would um, Europe not be stronger if those were not in disparate places? Or does the, is the competition healthy? Um, I don't, I, don't th I actually think there's enough talent to go around. I also think if you're in fintech in London, that just makes sense, right? Well, maybe it's Frankfurt. But the point is there's concentration of customers, there's a concentration of people actually understand the space, 
um, there's money, there's just, I think that's actually helpful. Um, just like New York, right? Like New York is a fast growing ecosystem and they've really built around sort of areas that Silicon Valley is not so strong in, ad technology, uh, fashion tech. They also have a lot of interesting e-commerce companies in ways that Silicon Valley is not good at. Um, Gabor, I think you wanted to jump. So I'll come to you. Uh, I think you wanted to jump in there for a moment. Yes. Well, first of all, um, I, I agree. Uh, if you think about Boston, Boston has life science and it has network uh, technology. Uh, so there are different hubs for different things. But I, I just have to say one thing: if you could wave a magic wand and put 20 venture capitalists into Central Europe and give them a bunch of money and give them the mindset that venture capitalists in Boston or uh, Silicon Valley have. I think you pretty quickly could establish a very, very uh, vital uh, area here that's like Silicon Valley because I think the talent, the, the, the energy, the innovation of young people is here. I just don't think we have the money here and I don't think people are willing to take the kind of risks that you have to take in order to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Okay, um, so would that be a, um, a domain specific area of expertise do you think or would that be a more general I mean, would it be specific areas or? I, I think that every, that the different parts of Europe could concentrate on different things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but here, you're talking about if you put... Hungary, for here. example, has very strong universities, has very strong life science, has very strong uh, software, mm -hmm. uh, B2B type software. I certainly agree that London would be great for fintech. I do agree that when it comes to Italy and Spain, uh, fashion, B2C stuff would be very successful. So I. I can't imagine, with all due respect to the European Union, a single uh, Silicon Valley in Europe. We're not that integrated as a continent, but I do imagine a number of hubs and then some relationship between them vis-a-vis -vis the venture capitalists and vis-a-vis -vis some of the management team. Okay. Martin? Well, first of all, I wouldn't quite agree that everything is so black and white. So I'm not sure it's about bringing in 20 people and a lot of capital. I also wouldn't talk down totally the strengths we have in Europe. It's not that the city of London is, is uh, no potential there for, for finance or, you know, that in other areas Germany is doing that bad in manufacturing. I think it's rather building on those strengths and scaling up and making it that. larger. So I think that's the starting point. And we do have brilliant people, but we need more of them with an entrepreneurial mindset, with a risk-taking attitude, also willing to fail. That's something EIT is very much supporting. And I fully agree what you said before, we can have multiple hubs. I mean, we do have London, Paris, Stockholm, Barcelona. There's many hubs. Budapest is very much up and coming in the startup scene. And there's no reason not to support that. I think that's absolutely brilliant and, and should continue. And it's also not, like you rightly said, that in the States, all the economic activity comes out of the valley. It's one of many. Um, so Kostas, you're a um, last man standing for the, um, the pan-European version of this. Are you rethinking that or do you stick to let one me, centre? Let me uh, describe what I think the problem is um, in, in two ways. First of all, there is a number of uh, diverse hubs already, as you said, in London, in Stockholm, in Berlin, in Tallinn or, or elsewhere. And uh, they are working well, but as the, uh, the panel title uh, says correctly, we're lagging behind. I think this is one of the reasons because when someone outside Europe wants to invest in European startups, they simply don't know where to look at. It's also the same problem in politics, since I'm representing a little bit more the political side on, in this round table. When somebody outside Europe wants to solve a political problem, they don't know who to call. And I think uh, when an investor wants to do the same um, with a European hub that has everything concentrated and everything in the same place, they're unable to do that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one problem that I see. And the other problem is that even if we did have this magic wand to bring the, the 20 uh, heavyweights uh, of investment and to get all their money, to throw all their money into the continent and on, on European startups, there is simply too much regulation by the member states at this point um, that, you know, they, they receive the final receivers, um, the startup founders, they cannot actually uh, have access to this money because of that regulation. So what the European Union is trying to do right now with a capital markets union that is underway, but is to, it will be a long path and a very difficult uh, path um, to go down, is to unify these regulations and simplify them so it can make it easier and cheaper for these people if one day we manage to, uh, to have them with a magic wand to invest their money in Europe to actually spend their money on the right startups. And this is not happening now. 
It's happening in the U.S., but it's not happening here. So I'd agree with the second point about having better regulations and making things easier. I don't agree with the first point because I, we invest in this region. Most investors out of London, for example, travel. You travel to, you know, that's your job, right? And your job is actually go and hunt for startups. You know, they don't just show up sort of on the street. So we travel to Berlin, we travel to London, we travel to Paris, we travel to Madrid. Um, you know, I've been last three weeks traveling as in Helsinki. Um, that's actually your job. So I, I don't necessarily think having one solid hub is actually the answer. You, your job is to specifically hunt for good companies and spaces and environments that actually make sense for them. Yeah, I would also agree that regulation is one aspect of it and Europe can do much, much better to improve the business environment, to facilitate that. It's something we need to work on, but I think the mindset and the entrepreneurial culture is a much stronger factor. Take the title of your session, innovators versus the government. I'm not sure there should be like football players versus FIFA, but they work together, you know, so the two of them should complement each other. It's, it's not that they contradict each other. I think that's something we can change and maybe also we can, we can test that on the audience. If I, if I say Serbia and migration, I think very few people thought of attracting good brains to Hungary to work with and start up a company together. You know, we have different associations when we talk about migration, when we talk about cross-border cooperation, etc. So it's, it's much more defensive rather than an opportunity. Okay. I started to say that what uh, Europe needs is money, but there is one more thing that Europe needs and talking about mindset, and that's the desire or the willingness to fail. I think that Europe uh, both at the governmental level and at the investment level is just afraid of investing in companies that are too risky and that might fail. And yet, if we look at Boston, if we look at the Valley, uh, the most successful companies are started by people who have failed in prior companies. They've learned their lesson, they know what not to do, they've learned how to do it, and, and that is also true of the venture capitalists out of every Ten investments that a VC makes, you know, eight of them are going to fail. Maybe one of them is going to sort of totter along and one could be a blowout success. That's the model and that is a different mindset than we have around uh, this continent. Okay, um, let's just pause there for a moment. Um, I wanted to ask um, the audience. Um, so you've heard a little bit now, so I'll see whether I can see you. Um, for a show of hands. Um, so how many of you think, uh, don't be shy, please do put your hands up, otherwise I'm going to be just be making it up from up here. Um, how many of you think um, that one hub is the answer, that, um, that you want a pan-European hub? Hands up, come on, put your hands up. So that's like one. No? All right, a few more than that. There's a handful. I'd say it's maybe a dozen or so. And how many of you think um, distributed uh, centers of excellence? Okay, so, um, so Costas, I'm sorry. I think, um, I think you're, uh, you failed to sway our audience here. Okay, so um, if we talk about distributed hubs then, um, Let's talk about distributed hubs, since that's what the audience uh, wants to talk about. Um, what do you do? I mean, there needs to be some sort of middle ground here between each for their own and a single concentration of excellence somewhere. Um, or does there? I mean, is there, if you had your system of hubs, do they still need to interact? How do you get them to, I mean, how do you make the most of Europe being a halfway to a political entity a halfway to, uh, certainly quite a long way towards an economic entity. How do you benefit from that if you do have these disparate centers? I mean, there's this U.S. saying, sharing is caring, right? And I think, like, one of the benefits of, of just sort of this new economy, of just there's expertise, I think, where innovation actually happens when different industries actually sort of, like, touch in the shadows of different industries. And I think, like, there's a lot of knowledge exchange that can actually happen. And that diversity, you know, in, in light of the previous speaker's sort of presentation, I mean, that diversity is actually incredibly important to sort of generate new ideas, um, learn from each other's mistakes. Um, you know, there's a lot, for example, like, you know, because I invest in so many different areas, it's super helpful to understand like, oh, this works very, very well in marketplace businesses. Maybe you could take this to finance, right? And so there's a lot of intersection there. But and who's I, the bridge there? I mean, yeah. is that you guys? I mean, is that, um, is that your role as an incubator of EC1 or is it a more formal? Um, I actually think it's probably, it's a combination of formal and informal. There's a lot of conferences that are happening now. I think there's a whole bunch of new VC firms that have come up, like, you know, Mosaic and Felix Ventures. I mean, there's literally been, like, several billion dollars of new VC money that's actually sprouted up just in the last sort of one or two years, and new firms coming about who are actually hunting for 
companies all across the, the, the continent, right? As you know, London, you know, UK, and the rest of the continent. Um, you know, you're starting to see a lot more of this, this sort of influx. And I think people are traveling, right? There's Berlin. Most of the startup scenes actually started not necessarily by Germans. It's actually from folks from all over the region. Um, and so I think that's actually a really, really good thing. If you have different hubs, it doesn't mean they don't need to be connected, you know, and I think it's never been so easy to connect, especially with all the digital tools that we have nowadays. So that's actually what we try to do with the EIT, to create platforms, networks, huge partnerships. We call them innovation communities, and they typically have two, three hundred partners all across Europe. So you have accelerators, you have startup scenes, and they're interconnected. So they can exchange ideas, they can get together, and yeah, it's all about mobility again. So I fully agree, and I don't see there that the two are mutually exclusive. And is it working? Can you tell us about how that works? I mean it is working because those, those hubs are the centers of excellence in the different countries and they can be different topics. So we're targeting different societal challenges, for example, climate change, energy, raw materials, health, and there is so much to learn across those different hubs and bringing together the different universities, research centers, and companies. And of course, companies, they're fishing around for the ideas, and then those companies can go in the accelerators, and then they get support, not just locally, they get local support, but they also can benefit from that trans-European network. So it is working, yeah. If you think about the US model, uh, it's absolutely true that you don't have these hubs that operate on their own. Venture capitalists will ha have an office in Boston, have an office now in New York, have an office in the Valley. If, a com if one of my clients wants to look for money, uh, they'll first think about who are the most suitable VCs to talk to, and half the time they go out to the Valley, either because they think they get money at a better valuation or because more likely they think they get more value added from the venture capitalist who puts money into them, or they go to New York now because New York is building this really powerful engine of venture capitalists who are coming out of the big investment banks and have enormous expertise when it comes to fintech, for example. So companies move back and forth, uh, money moves back and forth, and, and there's a lot of collaboration between these different uh, hubs because technology is converging. You don't think anymore about biotech without thinking about software, without think, thinking about cloud computing, without thinking about uh, the relationship of, of technology and, and, and life sciences. So there is more and more convergence. But I'd love to see a central European hub somewhere, hopefully in Budapest, and I'd love to see a hub uh, up, up in the uh, Scandinavian countries, and, and I think that would be incredibly powerful, and they would work together very well. Okay, um, so um, this is probably a crude paraphrase of what you're saying, but I mean, from, from, from Marvin, from Gabor, I'm hearing, what I'm not hearing is actually any call for government to be involved here. Um, so what, do, I mean, so you're talking about how, how this stuff works, because we have those channels of communication, because there are transport networks, because you're there to facilitate discussion and so on. Um, what do you want government to do for you, or do you want government out of the way, and that's the end of that? So, as the lawyer, I just want to explain one thing. The American government is very much involved. Mm -hmm. Don't think that it's not. First of all, if you invest in a startup and you lose your money, you get a tax deduction that, at, if, if you're at a high marginal rate, is worth 40, 42 cents of every dollar. That's the government involved without telling you what to invest in. Mm -hmm. but picking up 42% 42, 42 of the cost if you lose the money. If you make the money, you are uh, being taxed at capital gains rate, which is half the rate that I pay for my regular salary, which is, again, 42% marginal rate. Mm -hmm. So the government is involved in an invisible way. At the same time, the government is both at the federal level, the state level, at the local level, is doing all kinds of support not enormous amounts and not directed at particular companies, but helping to create the ecosystem. And they're very successful. Okay, and of course, um, the government is, um, it, it particularly, well, in the US, but I guess also in Europe, is a major funder of the basic R&D on which almost everything like, in the like, valley is. Yeah, based. like DARPA, right? Like, I mean, that's, we wouldn't have the internet without DARPA, and they're, they're doing tons of interesting investments, whether it's in biotech um, research, energy research. There's a lot of this stuff is actually very valuable for the valley. Cool. NIH, cool. yeah. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand more than 50% of research money comes actually from the Department of Defense in America. So I think you're being a bit modest that the government is involved at a small scale. It's absolutely essential. But then, of course, the companies, the private sector, should pick up the ideas, should pick up the research and put them together. And I think that's what happened in most of the successful models. And that's also something in Europe we can learn for. But it's a little bit of a hidden side when you only speak about the, the private sector. Yeah, and, and I would say that's the difference is that the government, when they do try to pick winners, like for example, Solyndra, other ones, it's a big disaster. Um, and I think you, you can learn more from the US model versus say the Japanese model, which is like picking champions. That never works out. That's been a disaster. Um, is that true? I mean, is it not the case that, I mean, does government not simply take bigger bets, riskier bets, bets that you wouldn't I mean, let's take the GPS system, which is the foundation of one of Google's flagship products at this point. I mean, Google Maps, as I referred to in my introduction. Um, I don't think, it's hard to envisage, um, so, at the moment we're excited about Elon Musk and SpaceX and about various other private space initiatives, which are trying to do one thing. Um, it's, I can't see that they would have had the vision to say, we're going to launch a whole constellation of satellites which one day will be useful in some respect or another. And that could have failed, could very easily have failed, and you'd be talking about it as a failure. Is it not the case that government simply takes the risks that the private sector won't? I think it depends on the situation. I mean, there's certain things like energy. I think the government has to sort of take the lead on because just there's so much more money that's needed for that mm -hmm. versus, say, like software stuff, which I think private sector... So when it comes it to lots of money, you want the government to be involved. When it comes to little bits of money, your money, you don't want them involved. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I think for me it's also a matter a little bit of more fundamental research, more basic research. I think that the government have, of course, a very strong role when it comes to later stage. Some of that research can be useful for the public sector, and then, of course, the, the, the government should continue. Some of it has more uh, marketing value, can be commercialized, and that's where private sector should come increasingly come in. For us, we finance public-private partnerships to exactly be at that interlinkage. So you have good ideas coming out of research, coming out of universities, which then can be picked up by this public-private partnership and eventually commercialized. Kostas, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think um, my take on that would be that governments, especially in Europe, need to get out of the way uh, of startups. Uh, I'm not an expert on how the American system works exactly, but I see a lot of struggle um, uh, on European entrepreneurs and, and startup founders when they begin, when they, they're actually planning to, fund, to, to found a startup, when they want to find a way to sustain it, uh, when they are at a later stage of, of their entrepreneurial path. And uh, unfortunately, in most of the countries in the European Union, it's not the easiest thing to, to fund a startup. And uh, the first thing we have to reform in the member states is exactly that. Secondly, the amount of bureaucracy that a normal company, because not every company is a, is a startup, um, that a normal company, especially a medium-sized company, which is 99% uh, of European enterprises are small and medium enterprises. So for this 99%, there is an immense amount of bureaucracy that is still uh, very high. And this is the government staying in the way uh, of these people. Uh, this is uh, killing jobs, this is killing growth. And when you see at numbers that uh, show that, for example, the internet economy in Europe is growing at a rate of 8%, when the rest of the economy is not growing at all or growing at 0.5%, then the government really needs to step back and reduce regulation, reduce bureaucracy in order for these people to create. And the second point that I want to raise is what I also said in, the, in my initial statement, it's about mentality. And uh, speaking to a lot of people, especially when we were drafting the plan, uh, the, the UCPP plan for uh, startups that we submitted to the European Commission President, Mr. Juncker, uh, last year, we talked to a lot of uh, European startups. And same as in politics, we also saw a difference in mentality from, from these people when it comes to what they want uh, from the government. There are crazy ideas like, um, uh, you know, we heard startups saying that we want the state to finance jobs uh, for the people we will hire. And we had people who were saying like, the exact opposite, that we want the state to do nothing, uh, not fund us, not make nothing easier, just not annoy us at all. Uh, so what I see, and I would like to insist on my position, even though it's not very popular uh, in this audience, is that if there was one hub in Europe 
where all the expertise and all the talent and all the funding were concentrated, then also the demands of the startup community would be more harmonized. And also the governments and the European institutions would know more what these people want. The problem right now is that there is no clear image and no clear demand from the startup community in Europe. Okay. May I, right. may I just give you one specific example? I mean, it's hard to appreciate how the inner workings of government operate in the US. So I'll give you one specific example. Right after the bust of 2008, uh, there was a building that was a lone building in a part of Boston that was nothing but a parking lot, an enormous parking lot for tens of thousands of cars, but there was one building that just got finished that was overlooking the bay and overlooking the downtown Boston area. That building was empty. They call it transparent. You could look through it. The mayor convinced the owner of that building to give away for five years for free to a new company that was started by two people who just graduated business school who would otherwise have gone into an investment bank but there were no jobs to start an, ac an accelerator called Mass Challenge. Then the mayor went around and, shall we say, convinced companies in the Boston area by saying, well, geez, next time you come for a variance or for some special treatment, remember that I asked you to do this and convinced them all to chip in $25,000, $50,000 as sponsorships for Mass Challenge, raising about a million and a half dollars. The state put in, I think, two or $300,000, which is nothing. Mass Challenge got free rent, got free furniture, and a million dollar budget. Today, Mass Challenge is incredibly successful. The building is full. Mentors of the building, including a guy named Josh Boger, who was one of the founders, just built two buildings for the company that he founded called uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals right next to the building that Mass Challenge was in. And this area that used to be all parking lots is now one of the most vibrant communities in Boston. Didn't take a lot of money, but it took a mayor who was willing to put out his neck and twist some arms in a very bad economy. Okay. All right. Um, so I wanted to, um, to ask the audience again, just um, uh, for again, for a show of hands. Uh, this time, and I apologize for the, uh, for the bluntness of this question, um, should government get out of the way or should it be more involved? So if you think it should get out of the way, put your hands up now. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. Um, and if you think it should get more involved, oh, that's tough. That's kind of, that's pretty close to half-half, but I think get out of the way had the edge. So, so I'm going to go with get out of the way. I'm sorry to those of you who feel the other. But um, so at the moment, we're talking about, um, so you've won, that's uh, one out of two you're yeah, winning so thank far. You. So. Thank you, guys. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so, what does our model for a European, to the European um, alternative to Silicon Valley look like? Well, thus far, we've established, the audience and the speakers here, that it looks like um, a system of hubs, uh, rather, a, a, yeah, well, a system of hubs that have a lot of connection between them, um, that specialize in particular areas, and particular, but that have particular expertise, um, and that government, sorry, Martin, the government should largely stay out of the way. Um, I think maybe since it's half and half, we, th we think there is a balance to be struck, but on the whole, less rather than more. So let's take that as our standing point. Actually, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, just, just two comments on that. As I already said, that sort of black and white questions may not be the ideal no, ones, not. because for, to get out of the way, the government would have actually to do a lot to remove all the burden, all the taxation, everything that exists right now, plus some of the public services being provided may be useful after all. Of course. But, but then there is the other side of it, of course, the funding. I mean, everyone said earlier that it's very, very useful, be it for the research, be it for the innovation, be it later on to help companies to grow, to, to give access to finance, and, and that's one of the things governments, European Union especially, is doing. So maybe if the question is asked again, do you really well, want no, us to stop? <laughs> I'm, I'm not totally I sure the answer will be the, the same. Question, but, um, but then black and white is what we're asked to do when we yeah. vote. Okay. You know, that, and unless you adopt um, what, uh, uh, I've forgotten her name, the lady from Democracy OS was talking about this morning, and suddenly everything is more liquid and fluid, but right now, yes or no? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other thing, as I mentioned to you, there's been almost two billion dollars of VC sort of funds, sort of in the last couple of years, have actually opened. A lot of that money is actually from the EIF, right? The European Investment Fund, which has funded these professional investment managers and VCs to actually go and fund. Um, so there is a place, right? But they also know, like, we provide the money, we provide the resource, resources, we provide the research, the core research, invest in that area. And the other piece is actually the regulation piece, is that we make it easy for people f to fail, right? So bankruptcy doesn't basically follow you all the way to the end of your death. Um, or other basic things of setting up a company fairly quickly. Um, I mean, or even doing contracts. Like I've done deals in Germany and it's a nightmare um, versus say, for example, in the US or UK where it's fairly straightforward, right? I can get a, go through a contract in less than a day or two and get it sorted out. In Germany, that was like a three, four week process. And I think the cost of the legal fees was probably the amount of money I actually put into the company. It's kind of a big waste of time, so. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, so I wanted to turn um, now to um, just a, uh, we have a few minutes left of the formal part and then I'll, then I'll be coming to you guys for questions in probably about seven or eight minutes. Um, so you've got a little time to think about it. Please do ask some questions. Don't leave me hanging here. Um, so I wanted to ask about, um, about values. Um, so we've talked about what we think um, Europe's system might look like. Um, we've talked about things that make Silicon Valley work in quite a mechanistic or instrumental sense. Um, what don't we want to Silicon Valley, or to want it more positively, what does Europe have to offer in terms of values, philosophy, lifestyle, whatever it is that, I mean, what the question I'm trying to drive towards here is, that hypothetical company in Peru, why are we saying, what's our advertisement for coming to Europe? What are we saying is, uh, would make it, make it a better home for them? So I think I'm going to move very far away from this guy, but, uh, <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley is a bit of a cultural desert. Uh, <laughs> uh, Europe is uh, an incredibly vital, uh, exciting uh, place for arts, for music, for, for, for all the things that, that, the, uh, Indo that the European culture uh, has taken to the United States. And, 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 and it's an urban environment rather than a suburban environment, which is most of what uh, the, the valley is. Uh, I couldn't live there because I just find it difficult, but I could certainly live in Budapest or in Paris or in Rome because it's a very vibrant city. You just have to walk outside at, I don't know, the only question is who is working? But yesterday I was walking around here in the middle of the day and everybody was lying on the grass and everybody was dancing and doing all kinds of other things that I thought were very interesting. And, uh, you know, you, you walk around in, you, you can't walk around in Silicon Valley. You get in your car and it's got to be a fancy car and you go from one building to another building. Uh, I think this culture and this city and this uh, continent has a lot to offer in terms of energy and in terms of quality of life. Okay. Um, I think... <laughs> there you go. I actually, I actually can't disagree with any of that. I mean, that's actually why I spend time out here in this region too. I actually live in San Francisco, incidentally, so I'm not, I don't live in the valley. That place sucks. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but you know, and, and there, but there's a joke, right? San Francisco is like it's the Las Vegas of work. Um, you go there to basically work, um, and that's okay. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think that is definitely a benefit in living here in living here in Europe, where it's like culturally, there's just a lot more stimulation, the diversity, just the closeness of actually, you know, being in France and being able to get to Germany, like just the, the density of the place, you can get it to different places. That's incredibly invaluable. So I, I don't contest any of that stuff at all. Martin, so I wanted to ask you, I just wanted to tweak the question. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're not going to disagree with any of that. Um, would it stay that way? If we brought the entrepreneurial mindset in, if we dealt with the red tape, if would it stay like that? I think it's definitely stay like that. First of all, it was of course very nice to let the Americans make that point about <laughs> Europe. So I was little to add, but but also to say that of course we do have 28 different countries. That's just in the EU, and even many more in Europe. So that diversity is something absolutely to be treasured, and and there is absolutely no way that could go away. Maybe one more argument also for not having one single hub, because we want to continue to have that diversity, and uh, as long as we have nation states, and I think that's there to stay. That that will continue that way and economic success would only make that stronger and in fact what we're also trying to do is of course within Europe to have those countries catching up to the others which are already far far ahead. So um, Kostas your, um, your vision of a pan-European hub is, is being likened to 
the Las Vegas of work on a cultural desert. Um, how would it not be that? How would you make it uh, lively, worth living in? I mean, Europe is very diverse, and uh, sometimes we, uh, we struggle very much in European organizations like mine uh, to agree on fundamental things. When you put a Greek and a German uh, to agree on the economy, uh, this, as you understand, uh, might cause some problems. But this is, on the other hand, also the power uh, of this union. And the fact that our market is so big, and let's not forget that the European Union market is, uh, is over 500 million uh, consumers, um, and the fact that it's also so diverse leaves space uh, for a lot of uh, industries to grow in different ways and in different spaces um, uh, with a different plan. So, yes, Europe needs to, to build up on its diversity, but it also uh, needs to work harder <laughs> when it comes to uh, realizing our ideas. Let's not stay with the mentality of just the dreamer, uh, you know, that uh, I have a big vision about what I want to do. 99% uh, of the success of, of a startup is not the plan or the dream itself, it's making it happen. And we lack this working mentality, unfortunately, in Europe so much. We depend too much on the state or in some countries our family. Uh, we are afraid to fail, we're afraid to risk, and this has to do with the general culture that comes from government, from a family, from um, um, the, the, the company you work for, uh, and the general life um, you have in European cities uh, like mine. So uh, I think Europe can be a home for startups, um, especially when it comes to uh, building up uh, you know, the talent and the knowledge uh, these people have. Let's, let's remind ourselves that young Europeans are one of the most educated generations right now in the world. And I think the knowledge-based economy can grow much more on this diverse model that also Martin talked about. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'm not gonna ask you the obvious question because I think that would probably uh, just be a universal, of course, culture is a strength. Uh, what I'm gonna ask you is um, whether, um, whether cultural diversity, um, cultural richness is sufficient to compete against Silicon Valley's efficiency, capital, um, technological nows. Um, put yourselves in the minds of that company in Lima, um, or for that matter, in the minds of uh, Prezi back when, when it's being asked to go to Silicon Valley. Um, is Europe's culture enough of a reason to come to Europe, or does that, is that not sufficient reason to, to stay here, to move here? So if you think um, Europe's culture wins, put your hands up now, please. Okay, that's, yeah, that's about a third, I think. And if you think that Silicon Valley being ruthlessly efficient wins? Oh, that's interesting. So you're roughly the same, but a lot of you didn't put your hands up there. So I don't know what you think. But, um, so a third and a third. So we think that maybe, maybe there's some work to be done. Okay, so I think uh, where we've got to um, is we're talking about, um, when we talk about an alternative to Silicon Valley, and we're talking about it from that perspective of that company in Lima or uh, RSC or wherever, um, we're talking about uh, many hubs across Europe um, that talk to each other freely, that communicate freely, that have um, a great deal of commonality and so on. Uh, we're talking about um, government being uh, at least a bit less involved than it is at the moment and getting out of the way a little bit more, letting things take their course a little bit more. And we're talking about Europe's cultural heritage, um, Europe's wealth of, um, of history, archaeology, urban, whatever you want to call it, as being um, a strength that could perhaps be a decisive advantage or something like that. So I think that's interesting. I think um, we can come back to that maybe in a minute. So um, we've come to uh, the point which I ask for questions. Um, so if I can, if anybody who has a question, please uh, let me know. Somebody must. Um, there's a gentleman there in a striped shirt. If we get a microphone to him. Sorry. Okay, so maybe here. Uh, <coughs> I think that uh, if we uh, if we look at uh, one of the one of the basic definitions of startup, so it aims to go to a global market. 
And uh, in, in Hungary or in Europe, if uh, we believe that, okay, we, build, we built a product that can go global and can scale uh, very well, our uh, first thought is, okay, we somehow has to get uh, into the US and uh, has to launch our product in the US, uh, test out in the US market, because if we succeed there, then we may uh, be successful at global scale. Uh, I don't know uh, what's your op opinion about that, but uh, is it possible that uh, we can scale a, a, a product or a service from Europe without uh, moving to San Francisco, for example? Okay, we heard so we, that we have limited time, so let's take that as a question. Thank you. Um, um, so, um, is it possible to, to scale from Europe to the world without going via the valley, without going via the US? That's fair, yes? That's what you're asking? Okay. Yeah, the answer should be yes, right? It's obvious should be yes. yes. You know, it is yes, right? I mean, you have Ustream, a successful company from here. You have Prezi, um, and there's lots of examples in Germany, lots of examples in Sweden, you know, Spotify, Klarna, you go down the list, like tons of companies have done that. London, there's tons of companies. I mean, you're seeing so what's, lots of... Um, what's, sorry, we have limited time, so I apologize for jumping in. Um, what, um, uh, how do they do it? Were they idiosyncratic, or does that exist as a, as a, is that easy? Is it hard? What do you have to do? It's, none of this stuff is easy, it's, um, <laughs> it, but it's, it's doable. There's lots of examples out there. Okay. You know, everybody thinks the, uh, that the uh, US is a single, very large market, and therefore a great opportunity. If you really segment that market, you realize that it's almost as segmented as the European market. And it's almost as difficult to penetrate each and every part of it as it is to penetrate Spain at the same time you try to penetrate Scandinavia or Germany. And at the same time, I do agree, you, you, you can go around the US and go to Asia, and you can go to South America, uh, Africa, and do very, very well, and, and may succeed easier. Okay. Um, Martin, quickly, if you would, please. Well, actually, you have to look at your market. So if there would be an easy answer, everyone could copy it. I mean, Skype, Spotify, others, obviously in their market it was possible. In others, it may be a good move to go to the US. So I think it uh, has to be decided yes. case by case. Very thorough analysis. Okay. Okay, a quick uh, remark and a question. Uh, I guess when we talk about Europe, we're not talking only about European Union, but also other parts of Europe as well because there was also an experiment in Russia to create a Russian Silicon Valley in 2009 uh, in Skoko. It was 30 kilometers from Moscow. And they invested huge amount of money in uh, Skoko. They uh, made contracts with major American universities, MIT, Stanford, um, and other universities. And actually from Europe, dozens of companies declared that they would take part in this project. But then, um, so there was a political will to create it, but then because of Russia had uh, other geopolitical... Um, so do you uh, have a question? So, yeah, <laughs> is the political will, uh, would it be enough in Europe if there would be a political will in Europe to create such okay. a... Uh, All right, thank you. So, um, the European project, is it more than European? Martin. Yeah, certainly it's possible there are many successful European projects, but you also do need a little bit of stamina. So to start something at that scale, like Silicon Valley, Skoltech, then of course, if you after three years, you stop it and try something else, then that's not going to work. You, you need to have commitment and follow up. I mean, uh, if you ask this audience, if they, you know, if they want uh, a hub uh, or a concentrated uh, like a European Silicon Valley, they will tell you no. And this, uh, you know, perhaps on a more, more divided scale, this is the case also among the European institutions uh, and in politics. Nobody uh, is able to make everyone agree on one goal. What we need to do is have a specific vision about what we want and agree on that. And this is something that we lack uh, behind right now. Okay, um, Gabor, briefly if you would. Very briefly. Uh, the reason I think the audience doesn't want the government involved is, is uh, are two. One. They don't trust the government. If they trusted the government, they'd be happy to be, uh, have the government involved. And two, uh, they feel that the government, in many cases, does not stick long enough to a single goal. Every time there's an election, there's a change. If there was a long-term commitment, I think government would be very successful. OK, thank you. And one last thank question, you. hopefully a um, quick one. Thank you for the panel. Yes, it's a quick one. Okay. Uh, a lot's been said about diversity, and I believe gender diversity is a big part of that. Um, yet. Or may panel yesterday we had no female speakers. So what's your view on that? Thank you. 
course, I'm not blameless here, but I was born that way. Yeah, full support of that, and I think one of the answers to that is more support to women entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in general, and also address that and build that into the policies. It's something you know the European Union very much stands for, gender equality, and we try to do that in all our policies to fight the right okay, incentives. Okay, so that's the, that's the European Union answer. What's the VC no, answer? No, I mean the VC answer is, yeah, absolutely right. And I work at a firm where half the team is actually females, right? Two of our managing partners are actually females and co-founders. Um, we've invested over a thousand companies. 300 of them are actually female founders, so we put our money where our mouth is. they're not here. I mean, I don't mean your firm specifically, but, um, but they're not represented here on this stage. What do we do about that? Yeah, I, did, I don't think it's a good thing, but I just okay. show up where I'm invited, so. Sure. Sure. That has been tried. It has its own problems. Um, so, um, so, just to conclude. Um, if I may. Oh. Okay, sorry. If I may, Not to conclude, we, sorry. We face this. Uh, the last word, he's a politician. Yes, we, fa we face this uh, problem with gender balance a lot of times in my organization. And I think the answer to that is that we need more dynamic women like you to step up and say, you know, I, I have something to say. And if I want to change something, I need to get involved. And if I, if I want to start a company, then I will do it on my own. And I don't need quotas or any other kind of support or any men to decide about you know, me being able or capable uh, to participate in the panel or not. And so there what I think we, we will draw What we need <laughs> is people like you to mentor other women to do the same and have the same dynamism. This is what we need. Okay. And you can take this okay. to an argument outside. Um, so, um, just to wrap up uh, quickly. Um, so, hubs is one thing. Well-connected hubs. Um, cultural diversity and cultural heritage. We said that. A little bit less reactionary government and more women. And that's what we want to do. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, please uh, thank my, pan my, my uh, the roundtable people. So that's Marvin Liao. Uh, sorry, I've lost you. <laughs> You've moved around. <laughs> Gabor Garay, Martin Kern, and Kostas Kiranakis. I did get there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.